Hello everyone. Hello everyone. Oh my God. Today is actually a very special day, a special Sunday, because not only we've got um, a legend as our um, Ask the Drummer guest, today is also um, National Hug a Drummer Day. I don't know if you know that, or lots of people know that, but it is national, it is a thing, it is National Hug a Drummer Day, and um, which is very special. So if you see, or maybe happen to, you know, like come across a drummer or something, else, just while you're out walking or uh, going to a gig or something, just give that drummer, give a drummer a hug, because, you know, and thank them for just being awesome and everything. But anyways, um, this episode is actually for another brilliant drummer um, and percussionist, um, oh, sorry, drummer, um, Chris Quinn of the Orchids and a percussionist, Paul Quinn, because today is his birthday as well. So happy birthday, Paul. I hope you're all both watching. And Keith, Keith, Keith Sharp, sorry. <laughs> this is also for him. But anyways, right, let's bring in our special guest for this week. It's David McCloskey of the Bluebells. Hello. Hey, hello. I have to give you a, a virtual hug first. Because did you know that? I didn't realize it was Hugger Drummer Day. I'm going out to the street after this and I'm going yeah, to hang out and see if anybody wants to hug me. Oh, yeah. yes. Drummer. That's, that's Put a your sort of, like t-shirt on and say, I am a drummer. That's a drummer. Drummer's t-shirt. Look, postcard. Postcard cats playing the drum. Hey, especially for your podcast, Ask the Drummer. Hi, Anna. Hello, how are you? Very well, thank you. Yeah, That's you how I follow, you using language like legends, and I'm like, whoa, okay. <laughs> Oh, no. well, I was not like I posted it. I posted the guest announcement to the Orchids fan page because I know, yeah, because I know that Chris and Keith Sharp, they're fans of you know the Bluebell. So I'm sort of like I said to them, it's just awesome to know that the people that I really love, the musicians I love, like uh, Chris and Quinn and the Orchids, that they, they also love the other musicians that I love. Oh, you know? It's um, it, I'm really and I'm really chuffed about that, you know. And it's amazing <laughs> that, that that cycle. We were all influenced by other bands. We're all influenced by yeah. other musicians. That's brilliant the way that cycle goes. And then you just, you know, you learn so much from peers. You know, I know as a kid, yeah. there's so many different bands and musicians that was exposed to go to punk gigs and uh, and it was just fantastic experience. You know, as a 14 year old, you know, going to gigs and yeah, so much well, inspired. Just, <laughs> it just makes it so like you know the, these people real people because i don't know whether it's just me being so like into music so much or being like so much of a fan girl but you think that musicians are like you know they're from a different planet they, they, they don't really mingle with <laughs> think so. different realm yeah. Yeah. and, then, and and then you get to meet like Chris and Keith, and then they tell you that they're also fans of you know these people. And I was like, oh my god, they're real people too. <laughs> they're people, absolutely. <laughs> Mate, drummers are interesting because drummers can be a bit crazy, but that's great. I think creative, crazy, you know. Yeah. <laughs> well, let me just say hello to Trevor Palmer, who's just joined us. He says hi, Anne and David. So that's um, Trevor. Right. Oh, yeah. uh, well, the last time, the last time I saw you was uh, at the Preston Pop Fest last August. In, That's right. Um, that was amazing, wasn't it? Thank you. Um, well, for us, it was really exotic because we were like in, in England. You know, we were allowed to travel out of Glasgow um, because obviously the eighteen months of lockdown that we've all been experiencing, um, and Glasgow specifically had this lockdown over different periods of that yeah. eighteen months that you weren't actually allowed out of Glasgow. <laughs> so uh, it was exotic to go over the border to England, you know, in Preston. <laughs> it was a gateway festival, that really well organised, brilliant bands. Yeah. Love, oh, love. I love it there. I was I always say, take me back to Preston Pop Fest. But there's a bit of sort of like sad news this week because um, Pat Fish, uh, the jazz butcher, mm -hmm. I mean, he was... Yeah, he performed it, and and I, it it hits me somewhat. I, even though I'm not really that personally, you know, like friends with people, but mm -hmm. 
you know, when you meet so like lovely musicians, and he was so lovely. It was just so, I, I was able to speak to him for a bit, and yeah. and then you find out that you know they've left the planet, and it just hits you. Yeah, doesn't that? It's like mortality, isn't it? You know, we're on this earth, and we're you know loving it and interacting and doing as much as we can, and you don't know at any point any of us could be disappear. You know, be um, beamed on up, but um. Yeah, beautiful guy and amazing lyricist and, and artist, musician. Um, yeah. yeah, well, we'll rest in peace, uh, Pat Fish. Well, um, yeah, but um, right, talking about Fast and Pop, did you get to see much of the bands <clears throat> uh, that were on that Sunday? Because that's did. Like the best. That was the best day. Obviously, <laughs> Obviously, went to see the Orchids, uh, and it was brilliant. That was bringing a lot of stuff back. Cause I remember seeing them in Glasgow many years ago, yeah. and just the beautiful sound that they had. And it's just great to hear people sort of years later, you know, more mature people like myself and others <laughs> just playing, but just with an amazing spirit, you know, um, and energy, fantastic. And then having an audience, you know, because that was quite alien after such a long after time. Such a long yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Seeing different bands perform, and I always find that quite inspiring. Some people don't like to watch the bands before, you know, if you're the main act, you, you know, some people don't like to see the, the sport acts or the other bands at other stages in a festival, but I love it actually, and it just sets the tone. And often you can be inspired from different performances, you know, yeah. playing on the same stage, you think, but that's a great way of playing it, you know, or just whether it's the energy or the volume that people are playing at, but really enjoyed that. Um, and uh, it, and it, it wasn't Amelia. Obviously, saw Amelia with them. Um, yeah, but, it wasn't Katina. It was one of her other bands. Yeah, yeah. groups, and uh, and they they were great. That was really good to see them because uh, yeah, because I remember Amelia telling you, I remember telling you that I saw them, uh, and then I came out after, and then I saw you, and I was I remember telling you that I saw her satchel, like her messenger uh -huh. bag at Talula Gosh. The little girl, yeah, right? that was, was so a cute. <laughs> Amazing. So Amelia Fletcher, and Amelia used to be a, a fan of the Bluebells, uh, and she was 15, and her and her friend used to come and see the Bluebells quite a lot. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they used to come down to London, and sometimes we'd be recording, or whatever, we'd be staying in London for a couple of months, and they would yeah. come and stay with us and stay in her, her hotel. And they were, we were talking about that recently, and she's like, we were 15, you know, schoolgirls. It's all very innocent, you know. We looked after them. And uh, but they were lovely girls, and it was just that, yeah. And then obviously, then they start a band, and then of course, her career is totally snowballed. And I know she does lots of things in her life professionally. Oh, but, um, oh yeah, 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 that spark, and then she creates a whole her own scene, you know, and that whole Oxford scene, amazing. Right. Well, um, I just want to say hello to Russell Irvine. Uh, Russell Irvine, come on Russell, down, Russell. Yeah, I'm sorry. He said, "Beamed on up, love it, Dave." That's why going up. Going up. Yeah. And then Chris, oh, oh my God. Chris. <laughs> and Chris Quinn, he's just sad. He cannot believe that David McCloskey talking about my band. Oh, God. So he says McCloskey. that, sorry. It's Chris. Chris, oh, Chris, Quinn. Chris. Yeah. He's just sad that he cannot believe that you're talking about the Orchids. Because I never got a chance <laughs> to them. They were brilliant. They were, they were excellent. And it really made me feel great about us going on because I thought, that is brilliant. That is really linked, you know, to our music. And just in a beautiful way, you know, in the Glasgow yeah. scene. And, and I remember you lent him your drum pedal, right? Because the, <laughs> the drum pedal that was there, apparently, is like, it's not working. It doesn't bounce back. All of us there. All of us there in your back pocket, you know, in your, your satchel. Yeah. Well, anyways, okay, that's it. Because I wish I could just go back to Preston Pop Fair. So it's that was excellent. Yeah, really well promoted and put on. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah but anyways, um, right. This is the 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 actual bit. So welcome to Ask the Drummer episode ten. Thank you. Anna. <laughs> today's episode is all about you, David McCluskey. Okay. So well, as as usual, we we start from the very beginning <laughs> like when um so you how were born far back, how far back do you want to go? <laughs> no, so you're, you're um born in glasgow that's right um, so and thereabouts and... it's originally outside in the suburbs and the burbs of glasgow um so a place called bothwell 
uh, which is a village uh, about seven or eight miles outside, kind of east of Glasgow. Um, so we were brought up in Bordwell, Uddingston, Hamilton. The biggest town is Hamilton. It's got a football team, Hamilton Ackies. Uh, some of people down south might know about Hamilton. Anyway, Bordwell, a small, <laughs> small village. But we would commute all the time. Obviously, when we were, you know, you're at school, you were going to gigs all the time in Glasgow. You know, obviously, that's where it was happening, you know. Yeah, yeah. We were going to uh, see bands just about every weekend, you know or a uh, dog in school and uh, yeah, going to see bands and hanging outside the Apollo in a meeting. Uh, yeah. Your heels. But yeah, so, Bottom and uh, Bothell brought up there. Yeah. Lanarkshire. Lanarkshire, yeah, yeah. And it's Lanarkshire. About three, four miles from Bells Hill, you know, people that know the kind of Bells Hill scene. Um, right, okay. Is that, is that where um, Aztec Camera are from so, as well? Lanarkshire. Aztec, so Aztec Camera are from East Cobride which from Bovo is about four or five miles away. East Colbride, kind of up in the, the, the hills. Um, and yet yeah, Roddy and Campbell, uh, yeah. in fact, we're playing the other night there in Campbell, bass player. But, oh my God. Ben, oh ben, my ben, God. Ben, <laughs> bass player of our camera. Uh, Campbell was there. So uh, yeah, Roddy was from, Roddy and Campbell, that's that camera, they were from it, yeah. Colbride. But it was, yeah, I mean, it, it's this, area of Lanarkshire, which is quite a small radius, actually, and there was loads of, obviously, a lot of musicians and bands and different scenes came out of that area, quite rich, and a lot of it was quite post-industrial, um, you know, a lot of kind of social, um, you know, issues whenever, the, you know, the industries closed down and unemployment, and but, you know, from that and came then, on shoots. Yeah, like, uh, Creativity. Amazing music that sort of, like, came mm -hmm. from that place. Yeah, so um, we'll talk about Campbell. <laughs> oh my God. You know, the last two years of my university life, I was actually just listening to Knife, of Aztec Camera's Knife. And mm -hmm. I remember I remember there was this photograph that I saw in a magazine somewhere that of um, Roddy Frame and Campbell Owens, you know, having this old man's tobacco or cigar or whatever they're they're holding this kind of it's a it's it's one of those famous photos you know the, yeah, with the pipes, pipes. Like, yeah with, the, with yeah. yeah with the pipes and stuff yeah, yeah. and then so that's always like stuck in my mind so yeah. <laughs> when i saw him at the car park of the continental because I just thought when I, that photograph is just so cute it's there. Quite then, yeah 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 and then i saw him in preston yeah. and i was like Oh my God, he's so cute! <laughs> yeah, brilliant guy, and and that really captured their their humor. You know, their kind of sense of humor, almost like yeah. you know, a couple of old politicians. You know, they're young guys, yeah, their tweed jackets and their their yeah. yeah, their humor. Yeah, and, and Roddy and Campbell were great, and of yeah, course, he, it, so and, awesome. and we 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 crossed paths because when we were at school. You know, Ken and I, my brother and I, we were in a, a school punk band and we would play, you know, like covers, Buzzcocks covers and Sex Pistols covers, and, yeah. you know, about 14 drummer. Uh, but sometimes our pals would cross, we would play gigs in other schools, you know, or community centres and Roddy would be there, Neutral Blue, you know, their first band. They were kind of like at school at that time as well. So okay, it was yeah. a small world, quite a close yeah. scene. All, we're all finding ourselves, you know, and punks yeah. with bikes and our <laughs> PVC bike bikes. Yeah, before I ask about your first band, um, this one here, Ken McCloskey said that this is your mum and dad. That's right, absolutely. They yeah. were so chuffed. My parents, our parents were so chuffed to be on that record, you know. And then <laughs> there's actually some stills from that record some of those photographs family photographs are on the young at heart video there's yeah. little smiles that come through and they were you know your parents are just so chuffed to be up there you know oh, they can't yeah. believe it. they're on the screen and on the record cover you know so that was lovely doing that because a lot of the songs are about family you know uh yeah. sisters and relationships and siblings and yeah yeah is it just you parents. and and can or do you have so, <laughs> well, we have two. We have two sisters. And, well, I have two. Did I was practicing this? We're in a family of five: mum and dad, oh. and five kids. So, uh, yeah, we've we'll got two sisters, Moira and Ruth, and uh, I've got two brothers, 
Ken McCluskey is one of my brothers. Yeah. Uh, uh, her older brother is Phil, Phil McCluskey. Are so they was, into music as well? Or? Absolutely. And that, that was such a huge part of our upbringing, as with, I suppose, with most families. You, we were, you know, you, you, you were exposed to their music. So as a kid, you know, I'd be about six or seven and I'd be listening to, I'd be thinking, what the hell is that? And it'd be my brother listening to Cream, you know? Oh, and, yeah, yeah. and uh, you know, Lou Reed, Velvet Underground, you know, loads of stuff that you're like, hey, what's that? That's strange. That's weird. Of course, five years later, I'm totally like that. Yeah, this is brilliant. You know? <laughs> uh, and then your sister, your older sister's listening to sort of hippie music and, um, you know, Cat Stevens and, you know, a lot of brilliant stuff. You know, her mum yeah, listening yeah. to Dylan. So the music centre was in there, the Smoke Glass Music Centre, you know, the old school record player, and just tons of albums. So it was amazing getting all these different uh, influences from the record. You know, is that the, those the dan dance set? Is it the dance set thing? That well, use? when we were younger, our neighbour had a dance set. So we used to go yeah. to our neighbour place, the Carrolls, Brian Carroll and his sister Teresa, and they were the first people in the scheme at the estate to have a record player and that's right they had a dance set so that'd be the 60s I mean I was born in 64 but maybe this is about 1969 something like that and we're all th we used to go through at the neighbor's house because they the trees are got a dance set for our birthday yeah. a little record player that's right and we would be dancing to you know all kinds of stuff you know it's like a, a kiddie disco you know yeah, and yeah. Drinking, drinking cremola foam cremola foam was a a fizzy powder drink that you made up and there was about 30 E additives in it, probably really bad for kids. But that was our champagne. So we had a <laughs> and the carpenters and the monkeys and we'd be dancing and we'd be drinking Trimola foam, which was like champagne for kids in the 70s. Oh I just remember that. Trimola foam. Sponsored by... Sponsored by, yeah. Sponsored by Trimola foam. See you after the break. <laughs> um, but the other siblings didn't um, join your band or anything. Is it just you and Ken who actually formed a band when you're teenagers? Or? So it, it was great. So like um, you know, we were at school and we were getting into punk and stuff. And uh, you know, Ken, my brother, who's not shy. Ken's two years older than me. Yeah. Um, and Ken, not being shy, there was these two guys we kept seeing. You know, at the bus stop across the road and they were going to this school they were going to the protestant school and we were going to the catholic school <laughs> so in different ways but we're both you know brought up in the same village so we'd look over and they had punk badges and then you see them with like guitar cases you know we think hey they're, they're punks and they're musicians so my brother was over there hey you guys so you guys are punks hey, do, you to, do you want to form a band and it was great because they had instruments you know donald Kerr had a drum kit and all that at the time i i didn't have a kit you know so yeah. we, used to, we got to know them, Dixie uh, um, and Donald Kerr. So Ken and I joined them and we would rehearse, you know, in Donald's bedroom. Drum. And have you always wanted to be a drummer? Or was it or was it Ken who said, no, you play the drums and you're all singing or something? It's a good question. I think naturally it was. I think drums was this sort of, because I used to sort of drum a lot, you know, like with knit needles and stuff like that. I was a, quite a fidgety guy, you know, probably on the spectrum. <laughs> But a lot of energy and uh, you know, and, and rhythm, rhythmic energy. You know, I remember going to school and being on the bus, and I would tap my feet. You know, on the bus, almost unaware. You know that you were tapping my feet. You know, on the floor of the bus, and there was a guy going to his work in the morning, and he just sort of turned around and said, "You're gonna stop that, yeah. <laughs> racket." You know, and I'm like, "Oh, sorry, sorry." So there was always that energy and rhythmic energy. And um, so I think drums was quite a natural thing. Yeah. Um, obviously, I had to learn how to play them. But um, And then eventually, our older brother, Phil, that was talking about, he used to, uh, he, he was a roadie for a local band called Lair. And Lair were what we, what we called at the time a heavy metal, heavy metal band, you know, used to call it. Okay, kind of heavy yeah, metal. yeah. So Lair were older guys, you know, and they would play like, um, you know, Deep Purple covers and kind of like heavy metal kind of covers. Yeah. Um, and uh, so the, one of the guys, the drummer was selling his drum kit. So Phil was like, that. oh, can I get that for my brother? I think my brother, yeah, I think drums would be great. Great Christmas present for him. So I got the heavy metal guys. Oh, wow, yeah. <laughs> bit of recycling there, sustainable, brilliant. 
And then I, so then I had a drum kit. Yeah, that's, that's so cool. But it's it's got to be in you, though. Like you said, you've got all this energy. But did you actually go for drumming lessons or? I did actually go for drumming lessons. And it was very, of that climate, it was very DIY. I mean, you were going to so many gigs, you know, as a 14-year-old, 15-year-old. You just absorbed it. You know, you went to see the band and I would hone in on the drummer and go, like, what's he doing there? You know, sometimes if you could just try and get to the side, yeah. to see, what's he doing behind that bass drum, you know? And then go, whoa, that's oh, I'll never be able to do that. But really inspired, you know, by the energy, you know, of punk. And you just yeah. watched it, tried to deconstruct it and learn from, you know, action, you know, learn yeah. from watching drummers and bands. But I do remember, so we had formed the band Raw Deal. That was the school band when we... Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Donald cool. and Dixie, and we got the band with them. We started off doing, you know, covers, Clash covers, Buzzcocks covers. Gradually, we've started writing their own songs. Um, and and I remember after about four or five weeks of kind of rehearsing, it was like, hey, we've got a gig. And I'm like, what? what? What do you mean we've got? Yeah, we're ready. We're ready. <laughs> and, uh, we played at the local school. But one of the gigs, we I, th I think we played at the local school. And I always remember, I didn't know how to use the bass drum. <laughs> so the bass drum was there as a prop. And I'm like, tick, 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 tick. yeah, I've got that bit together. But I didn't know how to use the bass drum. <laughs> By week six, so a couple of weeks later, hey, hold on a minute. Whoa, hold on. You can use <laughs> Yes, yes. <laughs> like animals in the Muppets. Yeah, drums. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we don't mention the D word. Yeah, sorry. We don't like to mention the D word now, okay? <laughs> sorry, that's a scene from one of the Muppets movies. Oh, really? the animal, <laughs> animals in therapy. And yeah, <laughs> drums drop. <laughs> well, before I ask you about Raw Deal, um, I just want to say hello to Monty Mandigoria. He's also got um Monty? A podcast. Yeah, um, he's in the Philippines and he's got um a podcast based in Manila called "It's All About New Wave." Hello, Monty, yeah. and also Chris has so like commented the link for um Cremola foam. Because he said that he remembers that too. <laughs> right. Fantastic. It'd be completely banned now, you know, if you saw the ingredients of it. It was just pure. We were all such hyper kids. <laughs> Maybe that's why I get any drums. Um, but yeah, it had about 35 E additives in it. And it was just so chemical looking. But we loved it as kids. And it was all your best bit for cream all of them. And you would just put a little five mil spoon into a glass. And then they just water. Get <laughs> champagne for kids so you've got the disco party your afternoon disco party in your neighbour's house with the dance set and, then you and you're passing around the you know the, oh, the criminal form yeah explosive and you Literally. feel like a proper, a proper adult so like enjoying <laughs> right okay we're going back to raw deal um i've read something that you were at you were only 14 and then um, there's some, um, like, um, I don't know, maybe it's like an equivalent of Ericsson the report called the Mars Bar in Glasgow. Right, yeah. And, and I've read uh, an article where it says that they actually used to smuggle you in because you're too young. Absolutely, absolutely. Is that, yeah, it was so the only place you could play. I mean, okay, as I say earlier on, you were playing at school discos and, you know, in the school hall or whatever, oh, or the yeah, school yeah. hall. So that was great. Sometimes you'd, there'd be a community centre gig, you know, in a local community centre, whatever, very DIY. But yeah, and then when you went into Glasgow, it was like, right, brilliant, we need to get into this scene. You know, obviously you were there as a fan, but gradually, Raw Deal, their band, you know, were starting to get gigs. And it was like, brilliant. So it was, it was pubs, absolutely. That's where, you know, that's where punk happened in Glasgow. That was the music scene. It was all pubs. A lot of really dingy, you know, uh, kind of shithole pubs, if I can say that. Um, but that was you know, grimy, grimy back rooms, you know, mm -hmm. old men's pubs with a grimy back room. I mean, that's what the Mars Bar was like. But it was legendary. It was amazing how you went there to a gig and it was transformed. You know, you might have a band with a, a bit of dry ice and you forgot that you were in this kind of grimy dungeon, <laughs> you know. Uh, well, when I Googled it, it actually says that it's a place of 
pilgrimage for the city's young punks in the late 1970s. Yeah. So there's quite a lot of young people uh, who used to go to the Mars bar. Mars bar was amazing. It was legendary. And I was very young, as you say. So I used yeah. to get sneaked in the back door. So the fire door, somebody would go around the fire door and I'd go yeah. in. And I actually remember one time, uh, and we were supporting, I think we were supporting Altered Images uh, there, and I was about 14, yeah. And the police arrived, so the, the police did a kind of swoop, you know. They raided the place, as we used to say, you know, looking for, okay. And, and they were going round everybody getting your proof of age, you know. Your yeah. ID, you got your ID? Yeah. And then one of the policemen just looked over at the corner and he was like, what? It's all you. Like Bambi, you know, I'm sort of like 14, <laughs> kind of like. And uh, I don't think I was drinking, by the way, but I was sitting there with, you know, there's lots of pints and guys like, yeah, you know. So, uh, but the fact you were in this establishment, you know, as a 14 year old in a pub um, and the police were right over there, right, what are you doing? What are you doing, son? You know? <laughs> And I'm like, well, I'm playing with the band. I'm just about to go in and play with the band. What? You know? So I think so eventually what did they, they did. Did they sort of like tell you to leave? Or, or they, they, warned just... me. they said, this place will get shut down. This guy will lose his license, pointing over to the barman. You know, he'll lose his license when you come in here. And then I explained that was in the band. It's kind of, they were kind of looked a bit bewildered. And well, okay, as long as you're not drinking. And I wasn't. I was like, right. Iron Brew. So you, were, so, yeah, you were able to uh, carry on. And you, yeah, you they were... didn't sell cremola foam, so I was drinking Iron <laughs> Brew, I think. Um, Scottish <laughs> national drink. Anyway, uh, so I was able to carry on, yeah. And that was amazing. You can imagine being, you know, you're so young, but you're in this scene of, you know, much older people. Um, yeah, in the police game. It was, <laughs> it was amazing. You saw so many brilliant bands and very DIY kind of, yeah. you know, culture and... Uh, you know, bands on stage and somebody had made a, you know, fuzz pedal, you know, and it was all really basic technology and people would just make their own guitar pedals and just all these bizarre sounds and whew, white noise and energy and, you know, punk rock and new wave, yeah. lots of different styles actually. Um, but the Mars Bar was legendary. And of course, the Simple Minds, the early gigs. Uh, yeah, were, I was, yeah, I was going to say. Johnny and the Self Abusers was the name of their first. The first, yeah. And? and they were like uh, the house band every Sunday, according to this article that I've read. And also, um, because it gained so much popularity that apparently the makers of the Mars Bar chocolate um, you know, threatened them, so they had to change the name change. to the Countdown. How so. <laughs> they even heard of it, you know? And how that would tarnish Mars Bar Inc., you know, chocolate bar. It was bizarre, but that's true. That's right. They had to uh, force to change the name, the name. Um, because of copyright. Yeah. <laughs> well, talking about Mars Bar, um, have you ever had deep fried Mars Bar? Because <laughs> that's like a Glasgow thing, isn't it? I mean, it's you go yes, a lot of folks say that's a Glasgow thing. And, you know, um, I, I actually, I think I ha had once, uh, a friend of mine had one once and I tried a wee bit of it. And I'm like, oh, fat, you know, it's like deep fat <laughs> and chocolate and oh, it was minging. So it wasn't for me. Um, sorry, that's a Glasgow expression. It was minging. Um, so, no, not for me. But um, you would see it in the odd chippy, but it wasn't like, you know, it wasn't yeah. that, that widespread, you know, deep fried oh. mud yeah, I always say that, you know, when I go to Glasgow, I'm going to try this. I'm going to try this deep fried Mars bar. But I went there, you know, a few weeks ago. But I just forgotten about it. I didn't know where to get it anyway. So is it like available at any chippy? Or no, no, just, no, no. It just be, There might be Special? one or two. Specialised? Really yeah, you would really, really need to Google it and go, where can I get a <laughs> in west of Scotland, Central Bell? Yeah, you need to. I mean, another big one, which is popular, maybe not so much now, but was in the 70s, is a deep fried pizza, you know, which, oh, when you think about it, you know, a big fat bread pizza, not a kind of thin based Italian one, you know, this yeah. is what you used to get in the kind of some of the rougher chip shops. And it's just, you know, the really fat, heavy dough, you know, submerged. In, oh my God. You know, and animal. <laughs> 
And then, okay, and then you bite into it, it's like, oh, can you feel fat and just start running in your chin? Third degree burns. You get third degree burns, you just get, oh, something to avoid deep fried pizza. Pizza. Oh. I love pizza, but not tea. I'm already having a bit of a heart attack just thinking. About <laughs> the culinary delights of Scotland. Uh, no, we're it's a lot. We're a lot better now. You know, <laughs> it's, uh, there are a lot of delicacies there. Um, yeah, yeah seventies. Uh, there was a lot of bizarre. Um, yeah, well, my husband just commented that in Manchester we say minging, minging too as well, because you just said it as well. So I've realised that after I said it, it's not just a Scottish thing. That's minging. Yeah, that's minging. minging yeah. <laughs> um, but going back to the Mars bar, um, I've also read that that's where Bobby Bluebell uh, found you, or he had this fanzine, according to this article, and he's a he became like a fan of yours. He he became a fan of Raw Deal and he wanted to interview you. That's right. That. right. And that was a really kind of iconic, you know, really cool fanzine, you know, the time. It was like Ten Commandments. Oh, brilliant. You know, we used to read Ten Commandments. What's it called? The Ten Commandments. The Ten, the Ten Commandments. Yeah. And then obviously you would go to the record shop and there'd be there'd be a whole array of fanzines out, you know. You'd be like, right, I'll get that one. Or, yeah buy a t-shirt and a badge and a fanzine, you know, so you had quite a choice, just DIY, photocopied, you know, uh, fanzines that would tell you what's happening, you know, the gig scene and uh, interviews. But that was a really cool one. Um, and of course we met Bob and he interviewed us, Rodeal, and we had just then been given, we'd played the Mars Bar a couple of times and then they, yeah. we got asked to do a residency, so play every Saturday. Uh, and that was all set up, and then it burnt down. <laughs> Mars Bar burnt oh. down. We're like, there goes our weekly residency. Oh, no. <laughs> anyway, in answer to your question about um, Ten Commandments, so that's right, Robert was the, it was his baby, um, and uh, he interviewed us, and uh, we were like, oh, all right, he was quite, you know, quite geeky, but quite cool as well, and he was part of the scene, you know, and he... And and actually he poached he poached me because he 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 was uh, setting up a th band. bluebells yeah, yeah he, he had bluebirds and he had the Oxfam Warriors and he had a few attempts at groups early groups you know who had done a couple of gigs and then they'd fallen through then he was like right he's wanting to start a new band called the Blue Bells um, and he told me later he's like I wanted you because I, I really liked your drumming so I'm like okay yeah. So uh, so he was trying to poach me from Raw Deal. I think he, he liked Raw Deal and he was like, great. And then yeah. ended up, Ken moved to London for a while, so for about a year and a half. And uh, then he poached me. You know, he's, he, he said, Rick, do you want to be? Yeah, I actually, I got me in the Bluebells. And then Russell Irvin, who was a friend of ours, played guitar. So the, the early members were obviously Bobby, myself, yeah. and Russell. Good friend Russell Irvin. Hi, Russell. <laughs> and when did um, Ken join the, the Blue Bells? Is somebody got a chainsaw there, Anna. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. What am I? The motorbike, so like, because we live along the main A6 right. road. So. <laughs> what was that? Are you playing a bit of de I'm death so metal? Sorry. A bit like death metal. <laughs> 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 uh, so what was the question? I forgot the question. So, yeah, but Ken, um, when did he so like join yeah. the purpose? So, um, I, you know, so as raw deal, let's say we were still at school, then Ken left school, and uh, the idea was he actually went down to London with a demo. We made a demo tape, four songs demo tape, and he went down to London initially, got the train down. And he was going to take the tape, you know, the classic, we'll take the tape round to record labels. Yeah, the record labels, yeah, yeah. We'll a record deal, and then brilliant, we'll be like a proper band. And that didn't, never happened. He did get to London. He did have the demo. He did pass it round, you know, uh, labels. And then we didn't hear anything back. Or else we got the letter from a few people. Thank you for your... Da -da 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 -da. This material we don't regard as being, you know... Um, uh, 
appealing to us at the moment. <laughs> we consider it in three years' time. You know, it's the, the classic generic knockback. You know, <laughs> no, we don't want to sign you. That's fine. So, uh, so he ended up staying in London, and our, our brother Phil, that I told you about, our older brother, yeah. was living in London. So Ken ended up right. He'll just move in with Phil and five other Scottish guys who all shared this flat, who were all doing various jobs in London. So Ken just stayed in London uh, for about yeah. two years. Yeah. And did kind of odd jobs. I think one of the jobs uh, was cleaning fridges and cleaning cookers in this kind of uh, white goods recycle kind of shop in a uh, oh, yes, yeah. um, yes. yeah. And uh, one of the guys that he worked with bizarrely uh, was Ariel Bender, who was the guitarist of Mot the Hoople, who was also cleaning fridges. And recycling fridges and so he was like, "Wow, Ariel Bender!" You know, it's like this guy with this incredible glam rock past. You know, yeah, do you, you know, cleaning fridges with him? <laughs> so, meanwhile, I'm in Glasgow and I'm saying, "Ken, you need to get yourself up here." So maybe a year and a half later, of Ken being like, "I'm like, you need to go up there. There's something amazing happening. There's an incredible scene happening, and the postcard scene was happening." Mm. So postcard had been set up, and uh, yeah, you, mentioned, yeah. you mentioned Aztec Camera earlier. Obviously, Aztec Camera and Orange, Orange Juice. Juice. Russell yeah. and I. So Russell and I, you know, from the Bluebells, we used to go and see them all the time. And we go to see Joseph Kay, We go through to Edinburgh, and uh, and then eventually we got supports. You know, um, the Bluebells supported Aztec Camera and Bluebells, and we became we became part of the kind of stable of Postcard Records. And we were signed yeah. to Postcard in theory. We never put a record out in Postcard, but we were signed to Postcard. <laughs> so, You're so part Ken, of it. I actually remember writing the letter to Ken. It was yeah. like, there's no mobile phones there. Obviously, you had a telephone, but it was like, yeah. I remember writing letters to him, sending him photographs and stuff. Oh, you've got to check this out. Check, there's an amazing scene. You should get, you need to get up here. Because I was thinking, obviously, Ken, I knew Ken was a brilliant, great singer, you know. Um, and I'm like, uh, so he eventually did come up and he's like, right, what's what's going on? So he would come and join us, the Bluebells, in our rehearsals. And yeah. Ken used to do a bit of he used to do a bit of light roading. You know, he would set the guitars up and all that. He wasn't actually in the band. And then he joined us on stage for one song playing harmonica. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then gradually did some backing vocals. So Bobby was the lead singer. He would do some backing vocals. And then gradually he started singing Thank some leads. And then you know, with the two the two main singers, you know, yeah, Ken, yeah. Ken ended up becoming the main lead singer. But of course, the beauty of it is the Bluebell stuff. Robert Bobby sang a lot of songs too, and we all sang harmonies and stuff. So we had the sibling harmony, Ken and I, um, which I think blended in well. Yeah, that's, that's brilliant, yeah. yeah. But um, Bobby Bluebell's name is not actually Bluebell. Bobby. <laughs> yeah, that's horrible. Like uh, you were telling me about White Tea before. Oh, I'm not one of these kind of like health guru, boring health guru guys, but uh, <laughs> I do like a, a Coronation Street builder's tea as well, actually. Well, I was all like saying that I've not heard of that white tea, so I've got to, I've got to find out about you know, where to get that uh, one. Louise, my wife, swears by it. You know, she's always like, oh, you shouldn't be drinking all that tea and coffee. So every so often, I quite like it. It's got quite cleansing, you know, quite light. Yeah. Um quite kind of barley, kind of hopsy, kind of, yeah, it's it's got a really nice flavour, actually. So yeah. white tea, yeah, it's supposed to be good for the blood and the heart and everything else, yeah. therapeutic yeah. qualities. Well, that's good. Quite like efficient. I said, you know, yeah, we learn something new every day, so I'm definitely going to find out. I'm going to Google where I can get that white tea from. <laughs> so we've gone from cremola foam to white yeah. tea. And white tea. You heard it. See you after the break. <laughs> I need to get the bolt, <laughs> the label. <laughs> but yeah, well, we're talking about um, um, the Bluebells, because Bobby Bluebell is not really his name. Uh, was there ever a sort of like um, a time where you were supposed to be called Bluebells? Like, you know, with the Ramones, that everybody's called the name and then Ramon. Were you supposed to be like Ken Bluebell or David Bluebell or something? And then Bobby no. Bluebell? It's interesting because at that time and part of that scene, there was all these great names, you know, General Jeds and, 
you know, a uh, Kenny Coward, and you know, all the a lot of guys just had these kind of made up second names, and it was brilliant. You know, it was just like legendary because it was part of their identity. You know, all these quite funky names, and you were able to transform your identity and your personality. Tommy, you know, Frankie Ramon or whatever, or Bobby Ramon, uh, maybe <laughs> something related to bands that you were into, or um, but all these really cool kind of made up DIY names. Yeah, yeah. It was that scene, you know. Um, so Bobby, I blue, he always had this real connection with Bluebell, you know, the name and the Bluebell matches was quite kind of inspired by that. It was quite a Scottish thing. I mean, there's an old song called The Bluebells of Scotland. Um, so there's kind of Scottish connotations to the Bluebells as a term. Oh, um, okay. And there was, yeah. you know, matches. Um, Is it a brand? A brand name? Scottish Bluebells. <laughs> Uh, and the lovely, <laughs> lovely logo actually, you know, it's like, almost like hand colour. It's um, like all these adverts in there. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so he was really, he really, he related to this Bluebells brand and Scottish Bluebells, and that's kind of where the name came from. But yeah. that, what was your question? Was it more about his name as Bobby Bluebell? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So we we we. we got, like, we used to, it started as a, as a joke almost, like Bobby, Bobby Bluebell, you know, and it kind of just, oh, right. like, hey, I love that. Let's, let's keep that. That's a keeper. <laughs> so he kept it, yeah. Yeah, well, um, you know, um, you've played with um, your brother, your sibling, Ken. And I, what I was going to ask is um, playing with a family member, is it sort of like a blessing or is it? You know, like a positive, or because what it is like. Well, I had um, I was talking to Des Morris last week, and the Morris brothers they seem to be like you know really solid, mm -hmm. like a tight unit and stuff. Yeah. But, um, I was also watching um, a podcast where um, they talked about Gene loves Jezebel and the Aston Twins. Mm -hmm. You know, were you know like brothers falling out and. If you think about them and you and Clem, Ken Plusky and the Morris brothers and you know like uh the Griffiths brothers or the real people, they're all like really solid. But yeah. then you think of the Aston twins, um Ian and Robin Campbell of UB40 and yep. the Gallagher brothers, you know. Is there like um what do you think is the reason behind or is there a way that these brothers will actually get back together being family and stuff mm -hmm. yeah. you can't generalize and it and it depends on the family dynamic doesn't it you know so obviously we were a family of five ken and i were very close you know um and especially when we were younger you know in mm. fact my mother used to dress us as twins <laughs> uh, she used to make her clothes and uh, she used to make like uh her school shorts and, uh, you know, we would have identical clothes. You know, she would just be like, I'll just make two of them or see those <laughs> or those woolly jumpers. I'll yeah, just make yeah. two of them. So we'd be getting about like twins, you know. And, probably got one. and Ken's two years older than me. So yeah. when we're very young, we're very close, you know. And uh, as I say, I, I was just going to say, so my mother would make the shorts, yeah, the school shorts, but she didn't know how to make pockets. <laughs> so we had these shorts, you didn't, you'd know where to put your bull. <laughs> Your marbles, that's your marbles. marbles. Right? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so anyway, we were very close. So, and then, of course, when it came to, you know, going into Glasgow, you know, and going to gigs, you know, from our small town, and then, you know, playing in bands, and there was that great protection, you know, because your older brother, when when you get to the age of, when I'm 14 and he's 16, he's 16 that's yeah. a bigger gap, isn't it? You know, when you're 16... You're a lot more mature and responsible. Well, in some ways, if you know what I mean. Whereas when I was 14, you know, you're quite vulnerable, you know. Yeah, and, yeah. And these kind of quite experimental kind of clubs and uh, dark characters. <laughs> um, <laughs> so there's that element of protection as well. And, uh, you know, just easing in to, to that yeah. with somebody who's a bit older and a bit, bit more sussed worldly-wise. Um, but is and, it still sort of like, do you... Is he still so like protecting you being the big brother? Aye, so I'm not Stay saying away. that. <laughs> that's not. It's like oh, I'm the needy child, the needy child. No, but just as that evolved, you know. And um, 
Yeah, you know, and, and, but of course, yeah, you know, when you're touring, you know, or you're in the studio and your brothers, it can be really intense. Absolutely. Uh, you know, and if you have, a, if you're a, a debate or a follow with one of your fellow members, it could be, you know, a creative disagreement, you know, or whatever. That's all part of the process, really part of it. And it's not a bad yeah. thing to have conflict, you know, when you're writing, you know, or you're recording or you're touring. It's not a bad thing at all. But of course, when you're brothers, it's a different way, you know, if you're falling out or disagreeing or uh, and you're touring. So you need space. You actually you need space from each other, you know, absolutely. So then, of course, you learn to see so your brother and you love him. But at the same time, yeah, let's choose you know, to space as we're, as we're doing. And, and that's natural, you know, of course. You can do each other's nuts in, you know. But <laughs> you, that would happen when you were a child anyway. And within an hour, it's forgotten. It's like, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, because you're brothers, you know. Um, so but obviously you get the extreme of the Gallica brothers and stuff. But, yeah, there is that that dynamic. Yeah, there's, very, there's intense, no very intense being in a band with your brother, but at the same time, it can be really fruitful and musically yeah. it can be brilliant because you, you do have this quite kind of attuned kind of way of, 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 of singing or attuned way of expressing, you know, which yeah. can really be a brilliant unit for a band when you've got this thing that's fully formed, you know, musically. So there's no danger of so like having a David McCluskey Bluebells and Ken McCluskey Blue. <laughs> well, you know, it's a bit like you know, it's a bit like Phil Collins. I've got, my own, so, I've got my solo career about to start, you know, and uh, I'm going to do my, my solo album is going to be me with a white piano, yeah, <laughs> a single red rose. On the <laughs> this is my first. <laughs> Album. I need you need to give me a title. I need a really Russell Irvin. Let's ask Russell Irvin. Give us a title for Dave McCluskey's solo album, Meet My Peter Um, and that's my breakaway career, you know. And, and obviously, I you know, I'm a drummer, I'm a songwriter as well, yeah. and I play guitar. And uh, you know, Ken and I, a band called McCluskey Brothers, you might be talking about that later. That's fine. So, yeah. I've always been creating in other forms as well, as you know, not just as a drummer. But, um, yeah. Yeah. Right. So, well, before we talk about the McCluskey brothers, um, I've actually asked um, some people about um, the Filipino because the Bluebirds are actually you know quite popular in the Philippines as well. I've I've told you this. It's before. amazing to hear that. It's brilliant. I know. Um, were you aware of that? That your music actually reached us in the Philippines. Amazing. No. <laughs> Well, um, I've asked um, some people to help me, so like do a survey of the Filipino new wave. Go there, yeah. love to go there, Philippines. Yeah, oh, it would be, it would be great. Yeah. You should you should go there when when the world is okay again. Then hopefully, I mean, we've got Monty watching us. So hopefully, um, he'll be able to sort like get the bluebells over there. You know, once everything is okay again. But anyway, so. Um, I've got people, so like um, friends of mine, who helped me find out um, what the Filipino New Wave's favorite, most favorite, the Bluebells uh, song. And uh, it turned out it's there's actually two. There's Forevermore, and oh, yeah. yeah, and there's um, Young at Heart, which sadly, because my favorite is it, I'm falling. Great, that's, that's my most favorite. But what? Yeah, but all the I mean, they said it's forever, forevermore, and um, young at heart. But there's actually so many things they've got. Um, they also said calf, um, mm -hmm. sugar bridge, uh, will she always be waiting? Everybody, yeah. somebody's full, and all I am, all I am yeah. is loving you. Those I, were also mentioned as well. I love that, and I don't know if it's a cultural thing. You know, certain cultures relate to that song, and not it's so much that song. Oh, it's that one. And Forevermore is quite obscure, isn't it? Because obviously it wasn't, it didn't really chart. I think it got to number 95 in the UK charts or something at the time. Yeah. It very well. It was her first single. But it's interesting that sometimes records like that or songs like that, you've kind of, not disregarded, but you've kind of forgotten about, it's like in certain areas of the world, you know, is that a Yeah, yeah. That's the sound that they like. That's brilliant. That's really interesting, you know, rather than just young at heart, you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's true. Yeah. Well, I, I just want to say a massive thank you to um, Alex Laredo, who helped me with this survey. 
uh, and also the members of this a new way um a facebook group called new wave solid so thank you to all the members of new wave solid who responded to that survey and also alfie malia who um posted it on this wall and asked about the you know people's favorite bluebell song so well there you go but um again um You've got like a really nice sort of like backdrop there. That's all like saying. I was so looking. Anyway, have a montage, yeah, to make it. Look <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. He's like my record player, but I thought, yeah, let's get some little images up there. Make it look a bit. Yeah. <laughs> well, you've had um, uh, dealings with like Filipinos, so it's not like I'm the first Filipino person that you've met. <laughs> you <laughs> through your work um you actually you've met filipinos before and um i was sort of like thinking it's gonna be you i'm sure they, they must know you and they must be sort of like thinking oh my god you know, i'm working with david mccluskey of the bluebells but um you said that this filipino guy actually because he's probably because he's young or I was just thinking about it that maybe if you started singing young at heart and then <laughs> like when you see him in the office and then <laughs> it was a different context of my life. You know, we've all got different areas of our life and, and yeah. you know, the last twenty years I've been working for an organization called Sense, Sense Scotland. So you so in, in England people will know Sense, it's a big massive charity that works with people with complex communication needs uh, and disabilities children and adults so we have that organization up here in scotland so i've been working with sense for about 20 years so i've been doing therapeutic music with sense um and over the last five years my role has changed the job title is lead artist sounds a bit pretentious but uh, i basically manage a uh, therapeutic arts teams um different art forms but including music, including, uh, yeah. a, lot of, a lot of training and uh, funding applications, stuff like that. So, which I actually like that stuff. Yeah, good and bringing in the cash and you know setting up <laughs> projects, designing projects for people and communities. So, and it's all dead creative, and I can use skills that I've learned through being in bands. You know, even the whole communication yeah. stuff where you're in a band and you're communicating with each other non-verbally all the time. You know, and then you can use the elements of that to work with you know, a child with autism or someone who's deaf blind or but training up people. So we've got these teams um, and what was going to say, uh, and also a lot of, there's been international stuff that I've done, obviously at conferences and you're presenting at conferences, just yeah. like, to, and then sometimes those people come over and you do a kind of exchange, you know? So there was the guy from the Philippines that was telling you yeah. about, right? And he's yeah. from uh, was it University of Manila. University of the Philippines, yeah. University of the Philippines is like yeah. the best university in the Philippines. So. And he's such an interesting guy. Um, and, and his art form was more, it's kind of like inclusive arts, but it's a dance and drama. So I love it when you can collaborate, you know, with people. Yeah, and, yeah. And practice, you know. So I didn't go in and say, hi, you may remember me from like, the 80s. I was yeah. a the bluebells you must have remembered them <laughs> bars of young at heart <laughs> not, not a, a separate you know context but it's separate thing. yeah yeah well um what's the where's the furthest you've actually went to for gigs um when you were in the bluebells because did you go to uh, India or did you go to like japan or japan, we did go to japan would love to go yeah. to india uh yeah went to japan and we went to Leeds, uh, Liverpool. Sorry, that's. A <laughs> I was all like thinking, um, what, what, did, what did you say? <laughs> so, you know, America, and uh, <laughs> so yeah, you we, we, we toured a lot. Yeah, and you toured and America fact, quite a lot, didn't you? Just well, like, it, we actually did just one tour of America, um, but it was great because it was like quite sort of DIY tour. And there was a yeah. promoter at the time. Um, it was actually a really good setup, but it was through the record label. But the promoter, it was he had this kind of framework tour um, that lots of bands would come over. Bands of a certain size, you know. So like, okay, if you were a band that couldn't quite fill the local theatre, you know, the three thousand capacity, but actually you'd fill a club. You know, that club might be a thousand people. You know, or yeah, yeah. hundred people. So there was this kind of smaller circuit network of gigs 
in all the major cities of America. So we did that too, and it was brilliant. So quite economy based, as in you, um, you know, that the gear was all hired, you know, in each city. So you went to Chicago, your drum kit was there. Obviously, you had stipulated what kind of kit you would like or what kind of guitar amp. Anyway, yeah. lots of bands, lots of British bands, you know, did that through this promoter and you went over and it was fantastic. Uh, and of course there was a whole scene there, you know, and quite yeah. often, you know, cause I remember we went to uh, Atlanta, Atlanta, Georgia, and we, we had a cousin, Ken and I, our cousin lived in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, yeah, and yeah. We had phoned her up and said, all right, we're, you know, we're playing a gig tomorrow night. Do you want to come and see us? So she's like, yeah, yeah. So then when she came to the area, it was quite a downtown area, you know, and she's like, yeah, quite a funky area, this, isn't it? She couldn't find it. She didn't know anything about this this area or this street, you know. Um, the other side of the tracks, but it was brilliant, you know. It was great. So you got to see real, uh, really interesting parts of America, you know, and, and grubby parts and, and, yeah. and just dead interesting communities. And um, So it's a whole education. As I always say, I like to quote Willie Nelson, you know, we received our education in the cities of the nation, me and Ken, and Russell, and Bobby, because uh, you learn so much touring, you know, and touring the world, you know. It's yeah, like, yeah. Countries we, never, we didn't go to, but, um, and obviously Louise, my wife, and I have done lots of traveling worldwide. Oh, yeah. Uh, so that's been you've brilliant. Never been, you've never Except been to the Philippines, though, have you? You've never been Sorry? to the Philippines? You've never been to the Philippines, though, have you? No, no. no you should go. It's a beautiful country, the Philippines. So maybe you should go there. Well, once, once the world is okay again. But okay, but is it true that uh, when you came back after your tour of America, the Smiths happened, and that basically so. Like... We kind of came back and thought, who, who are these yeah. guys? The Smiths, you know, we have them. They sound brilliant. They sound great. Um, but that's right. Or oh, that they were. It was just like a bit of, you know, absolutely. They were. They were massive. And in fact, yeah, you know, you could sense that over. And when you're talking to the record company in America, it's like, yeah, the we just signed the Smiths. You know, these guys. You know, um, yeah. and obviously, when you heard them, you could hear all the influences, of course. Um, but yeah, obviously, Morrissey, very unique and great yeah. songwriter. And uh, but they they became massive everywhere very very quickly. That's right. Yeah. Uh, Craig Gannon, our guitarist, you know. That's right, uh, yeah. Craig, went to the yeah. Smiths, you know, later on. Um, and Craig was an Aztec camera, and he, he was in the Bluebells a couple of years. Yeah. And Craig's a brilliant guy uh, and a good friend. And so lots of connections there with the family tree of bands and musicians. Yeah, and, yeah. And but, um, yeah, I was going to sort of like say, I didn't know this, but um, when I was sort of like, you know, googling the blue bus and so i didn't I, I didn't know that you actually split up in 1986. The, I, it's yeah and then you formed well or you became like the mccluskey brothers I, it, it, was, it was that transition it was quite because i can't actually remember as technically that's it we're split up what we do remember is we were touring a lot and then you know we come back from europe and we've been all over you know Germany and France and, um, you know, when we came back, it was kind of like the record company kind of almost had forgotten about us, you know, or there was a lot of new people, new staff. Um, oh, you know, and Ian Smith. <laughs> Smith arrived. Smith and Smith were sitting in their chair in the record, the record office. No, get out of my No. So uh, we'd been away for a while, and then a lot of people thought, all right, the Bluebell split up. It's like, no, no, we've just been touring for two years, you know, touring the Sisters album, you know, yeah, um, yeah. and we come back. So it ended up, yeah, the, the key people who had signed the Bluebells, a guy called Roger Ames had moved on to like, a massive job and took over Sony Music or something. So all of a sudden, those people that you had that relationship with and that creative relationship with were no longer there. Um, and obviously things had moved on and it was like these different scenes, different bands, as happens. It's fine. So we ended up, yeah, the record company got us doing demos. We did loads of demos and they, they didn't like any of the new stuff that we were recording and writing. And basically it was like, we want another young at heart. We just, yeah, can we not just do a track with the same backing track and just give us some different lyrics over it? You know, it was that kind of attitude. They just wanted, yeah, they didn't really want to have to put too much work into marketing. And we were quite a different band at that point, actually, because we'd, as I say, we'd been touring a lot. 
um, yeah. and just come for a big European tour. And then you were getting really good live, actually, but also kind of writing as well and um, becoming a, a different kind of band, you know, not just like mm -hmm. a box kind of um, <laughs> bad makeup band. Um, there was a bit of uh, substance there as well. We were really growing into something else, which maybe the record company didn't like. That was fine. Um, so we just decided, so we ended up in cold storage as in we were doing demos and demos and demos for the label. And then every month you would send them the new demos. They didn't like it. We're like, well, we're out here. You know? So wow. Ken and I, because we'd written loads of stuff and we were kind of, it was all getting a bit high production, you know, like they were bringing in producers that we didn't like and doing all these demos that were a bit overproduced, um, getting ridiculous. <clears throat> And, uh, you know, it was the days of, you know, the analog days where it was like, you know, you had, it was, a, you know, a 24 track desk, you know. Yeah, and, yeah, and yeah. And then, okay, uh, we need some more track. We're running out of tracks here. You know, we've got 48 tracks of backing vocals, you know, harmonies on the song. So we need more tracks. What will we do? So you'd be in Air Studios and they would actually physically wheel in another 24 track desk. And hook it up. These are the old days. The old days. <laughs> but just, and hook up this. So then you've got 48 tracks. Right. Okay. Let's get in a bit ridiculous. Um, and Ken and I were, were doing some a bit more earthy. Um, you know, we were always into sort of folk music and mm -hmm. um, yeah. really stripped down, kind of soulful, um, you know, kind of folk music and acoustic singer songwriter kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. So we decided to go our own way and put out an album as the McCluskey Brothers. As McCluskey, but you play sort of guitar. You don't, you didn't play the drums when you were um, in a, the McCluskey Brothers. Yeah, it's guitar and vocals. Obviously, Ken and I sing. Guitar and vocals, yeah. I'm main singer, and I do harmonies, yeah. songs I sing live, I lead as well. But yeah, 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 yeah guitar. And I also yeah, found that. Yeah, yeah, sorry. sorry. Uh, I also found out that you've had an album released in 1987, but two weeks later, apparently, it was deleted or it was removed because uh, apparently you're still officially the Bluebells. We're under contract, that's right, that's right. Yeah. So we breached the contract by kind of sneaking out the back door of the office, the, the, the <laughs> company, so to speak, going and recording our own album as the McCluskey Brothers. Yeah. Um, and then we released that... Um, our live our agent uh gig agent uh paul boswell had this label and we're like that would be great we found an outlet to put a record out uh it was an album called aware of all aware yeah, yeah yeah and uh we put that that's right and then the record company found out and they were like no 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 no, no. you're still contracted to london records you know to phonogram you, you can't you know so they had us in this cold storage as in we weren't allowed contractually you weren't allowed to release and yeah. release everything hideous yeah. lots of musicians will have been through this it was absolutely hideous stopped you from working you know um and we used to say it was like being in cold storage in a freezer they just leave, they just wanted to leave you there and then yeah. if they needed to put something out they could you know but you weren't allowed to 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 work in any other way because they owned you you know they owned you and uh you know the record contracts really outrageous you know i mean our manager um was our pal you know mark wilson yeah, yeah. great guy but obviously we're quite naive as we all were you know so there was well you're quote. still you're young you're still yeah. young you didn't then. realize you were signing for 30 years you know yeah um which i think know. which i think is the reason maybe maybe it's the reason why <clears throat> uh ken mccluskey is now teaching music business <laughs> that's, that's <laughs> the art of I'm with all that experience and that knowledge. Brilliant. It's fabulous that we can use use that, you know, that info yeah. and that insight. And it's no different today. You know, there's still a lot of, you know, dodgy dealings and corrupt dealings. And so yeah. it's great to be able to share that awareness, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, and wait, what happened to the album? Is, is it still available? Or well, I think initially... Uh, initially, we put uh, it was I think it was just a couple of thousand uh, copies, you know, issues that, it, that came out eventually. Because I think, you know, when things they put an injunction on something, and then it's like, oh no, you can't get this; it's deleted. Then it becomes a wee bit more valuable for geeks, you know, <laughs> out there that'll find it somewhere. So it was yeah. just a small release, that's right. But eventually, uh, a Japanese company called Vinyl Japan 
yeah. Bought, yeah. bought the record. Um, and we, we eventually signed to a manager called Pete Jenner, who's a fantastic guy, beautiful man. Um, Pete used to manage The Clash and Pink Floyd and, you know, a London kind of heavyweight manager. Um, so he kind of helped us when Young at Heart became a hit again and the record label were wanting us to do, hey, do Top of the Pops. And it's like, no, no, hold on. We've got a totally different career now. You know, we're not going to jump like lap dogs for this. <laughs> Yeah. But anyway, the leverage of Pete Jenner renegotiated the contract for the Bluebells and things like releasing us to be able to then do our own, you know, McCluskey Brothers material and be able to release that. So he severed all that horrible, you know, um, constriction, you know, stopping us putting stuff out and royalty deal, uh, royalty rates and all that. He was able to change that. So it kind of sorted us out, actually, with that great we're finally starting to get what we're due you know yeah so that was a is, there, is there um maybe plans of reissuing a wearable or a uh, it, it's, it's a good question i mean it's obviously it's up there on spotify and apple music and all that usual outlets uh it's a good question that may happen yeah. may happen um our second album which is called favorite colors, favorite colors. And that's that's actually the artwork for it there. You probably you maybe can't see it very well. That... That's the kind of artwork for it. Um, so and that's available uh, from past night from Glasgow, right? That is going to be available. Um, oh, going just, to yeah. Just listened to the test pressing last week. Just got a test pressing. So um, that may be available. You know, I'm just trying to think time scale wise. Maybe Christmas. Maybe January, mm. uh, 2022. So favorite colors, and we're, we're just really pleased with that because it, it actually sounds brilliant, you know. And it's kind of that mix of, you know, our first McCluskey Brothers album was aware of all quite folky, um, and really the, the second album just kind of marries everything that we love about sort of pop music, you know, and yeah, roots yeah. music. And it, it's a kind of nice, it's just a beautiful confusion of all our influences, really, you know. Um, and we're quite chuffed with it because we think it sounds quite, it actually stands up. You know, some records you do in the past, and then you think 30 years later, you think it's really dated, really not travels very well. Actually, Favourite Colours has, in my opinion, it sounds brilliant, you know. So it's just been remastered by Paul McGeekin, good friend of ours. Yeah, and it's yeah, yeah, yeah. So looking forward to seeing that, that out. Well, Chris, Chris said that he's got a Wear of All album. Ah, he's the original he an amazing album. So, and he also said that his first Bluebells, he, he also said his first Bluebells gig was in 1986 at Glasgow University. At Glasgow with, University, wow! Yeah, uh, with the, Love and the, Money and You and Cry also playing. QM. Now, would that be the QM, Chris? The Queen. QM, sorry, QMU. Yeah, QMU. He said. Right. Yeah. Queen Margaret Union. Yes, which yeah. was brilliant, and that that was a great gig. You know, it was just student you know venue that was a brilliant gig i mean nirvana and bands like that all played it later on wow. you know, small venue probably yeah. held six, he, six seven hundred but that was a brilliant place to play the student union he also said that the first mccluskey brothers gig that uh, was possibly the same year a, a small pub called the fix the oh, fix on Miller Street in that's right god great great memory there chris yeah. Fix, that's right. There's Mitch a band called The Fix, though, isn't there? Like with the The Fix. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think they're hideous. I think from memory. But anyway, um, <laughs> the thing that's a band, you know, like guitars with no heads in the end of the guitar. <laughs> and, and big hair. I'm seeing big hair. You know, I might be totally wrong. But I'm seeing big, <laughs> fluffy perms. Um, the eighteen. It's the 80s, right? Sorry if there's any Fix fans out there. Um, well, there's a really nice one called Secret Separation. That's by the Fix. Is that right? Okay. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah. So all these are like um, so from the Bluebells to McCluskey Brothers, and then you came back because of that Volkswagen advert in yes. 1993, and you went, uh, you did Top of the Pops. Um, there were also other bands that you played in. And I went on um, I went on Discogs to look you up, and it's got like adventures in stereo. I funny you should say that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I played in some of their stuff, uh, and I did an album that, that one there, uh, alternative stereo sounds. 
that's Jim Beatty. Jim used to be in Primal Scream. Right. Primal okay. Scream Mark <clears throat> in the early days. And Judith, that's Judith's face there. Great singer. Uh, I saw so lo loads of bands. Um, yeah. And a uh, band called, where's that? I, I, there's a great band called Snow Goose. In fact, we were playing some gigs as the, as the Bluebells, actually, a couple of acoustic gigs uh, a few months back. And uh, you can see it, Snow Goose. Snow Goose, yeah. Brilliant yeah. Band. Uh, and their singer's called Anna Sheard. And oh. the, that's, uh, the, 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 that band was set up by Jim, Jim McCulloch from Soup Dragons. And they remember the oh, group. right. Yeah, yeah. So, and that, uh, Anna Sheard is the singer. They're, they're, they're brilliant, you yeah. know. Uh, I think Raymond from Raymond from Teenage Fan Club actually played so, on that album as well. In fact, we recorded it. In, also in the the house. We recorded <laughs> it. In the house, uh, so they've got a new album out, but they're brilliant, Snow Goose. So, I, and interestingly, I was just going to say, not blowing more than trumpet, but on that album, I'm I'm not playing drums. I'm playing hammer dulcimer, an instrument called a hammer dulcimer. Yeah. Look it up. Yeah. Look at all that, um, and. Just from what you were saying earlier, there's something we were saying about being a drummer. I mean, drummers r drummers can play any instruments. See when you find what's going on in the drummer's minds, you know, um, just, you know, sequencing and just the way the brain works and um, and the whole physicality of drumming and the coordination and, mm -hmm. um, you know, the motor skills and all that, without getting into the science of it. Y it just the mechanics of it, other instruments, you just kind of can suss quite quickly. I'm not saying you can be a virtuoso in everything, and I'm not saying I'm a virtuoso in any instrument, but yeah. um, it's amazing how you know you just relate, you can figure out how to play instruments. Ah, right? oh, got it, right, okay, you know. Um, so, Hammer Dulcimer, a wee extension, and one of the, I play percussion as well, most drummers play percussion. But, uh, that's a percussive instrument because it's an instrument that's got about a hundred strings. There's lots of different versions of the hammer dulcimer. Mine's, I think, it's got a hundred strings. Bit of a nightmare for tuning. So I played with a band <laughs> called Trash Can, Trash Can Sinatras uh, on one of their albums called A Happy Pocket, and it's got hammer yeah, dulcimer. Yeah, I was gonna, yeah, I was gonna say that as well. Two tracks on there, which hammer dulcimer sounds really beautiful, you know, and it's quite kind of um, kind of sparkly. You know, high pitched, and it's you play it with little wooden beaters, the hammers. So basically, you're hammering down on strings, courses of, of strings. Yeah, and if you yeah. off, John Barry, the composer John Barry, used a lot of dulcimer in his, you know, the, the Epcus the files, um, and you know, lots of sort of fifties kind of uh, Cold War, you know. Um, Spy, spy movies. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. Um, there's Hammer Dulcimer and a lot of that. So yeah. different countries have a different name for that instrument. So the instrument originally, I'm going to be a really boring musicologist here. <laughs> it's, it's Hammer really interesting. In, in Iran, in Persia, in Iran, Persia, uh, the, the instrument is called the Santur, and it's an ancient instrument, you know. And and there, that you know, there's this ancient stone carvings of hammer, yeah. dulcimer. hammer dulcimer would be played at ritual, ritualistic ceremonies. And it would be animal gut instead of metal string. Now it's like piano wire, piano strings that you use for it stretched. Anyway, guts, animal gut strings played with little wooden beaters. Um, and yeah. a Persian instrument, but you also hear it in Roma, gypsy Roma music, uh, Eastern European, you know, often in our travels, you know, you you would yeah. see it say, you know, a couple of people playing dulcimer and the dulcimer, a sambal, yeah. a sambal, yeah. sambal. They call it a sambal uh, in sort of like sort of Hungary and uh, Czech Republic. So it's got all like, these different names. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And different tunings and modalities and key and scales. It's an amazing instrument. I love it. So you play all that. There's also um, um no mistake. Uh, is, how do you pronounce it? Boran? The Boran. Boran or Boran, yeah. Uh, yeah, a lot, of folks, a lot of folk call it the Boran, the Boran. The, you know, in Ireland, it's the Boran. The it's, Boran. A, it's, yeah, a, yeah. it's a Gaelic word. Uh, which I've seen that before. It's like a round thing and you just go, it's like an Irish, it's an Irish instrument, isn't it? I think so, the Scottish and the Irish 
argue about where it comes from. Is it Scottish or Irish? But basically, oh. Scottish, <laughs> Scottish and Irish are the same people way back. Right? <laughs> yeah. same. A couple of different tribes, but actually we're the same people. So, uh, and get Gaelic and Gaelic is the same language. Irish Gaelic, yeah, yeah, yeah. Language, but it has different yeah. nuances. Uh, so the bowing, yeah. So the bowing, you get you hear it in a lot of folk music, and it's a, a stretched skin. Yeah, so a skin stretched over like a round uh, frame, a circular yeah. frame. Uh, so so traditionally, pig skin, usually pig skin. Um, although this is maybe a bit bad taste, but somebody told me, I remember a bowing maker telling me, you know, in years gone by, the best skin to get the best tone in a bowing, this is maybe 100 years ago, right? He's talking about, and he said, what the old, the old guys used to do that made bowings, they would use greyhound skin. Like, because the greyhound skin has got a great tone. Oh, okay, so let's not go there. Right, we'll yeah, let's not go. Yeah. Years, years gone by. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. An yeah. experiment yeah. of beasts <laughs> of the fields, you know. Wild boar, wild boar. Uh, and then you get the beater, yeah, and then you play the beater across. Yeah, the yeah. And that's a great instrument because I always remember when I started to learn to play that after playing drums and rock drums and all that. And I thought, great, bowing, uh, this will be easy. And it's like, eh, eh, it's a totally different style of holding the siskin, you know, holding the stick. It's a completely different, you know, so I had to really learn how to yeah, hold your body and the right. and the movement across the drum. So it's always yeah. interesting, lots of new ways of, you know, altering what you know or unlearning, you know. It's not like, oh, you're a drummer, yeah. you don't play that. Not necessarily. <laughs> like if you try and a drummer tries to play, like, um, mm -hmm. Uh, tabla, you know, Indian tabla. I love Indian yeah, tabla. Yeah, yeah. Really complex Indian classical music. You know, it's stunning when you see these people playing, you know, you're like, whoa. But somebody gave me some lessons in the in the tabla, and obviously I wouldn't say I'm, I'm a tabla player, but again, just different techniques and nuances with your pressure of your hand and the skin and the beautiful. <laughs> well, uh, there are other bands that you played in, um, one called Sugar Town. They're like from Friends again. Um, so that was, that was, Sugar Town was uh, Skin uh, from Hipsway. Yeah, uh, yeah, Skinner, yeah, yeah. 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 And uh, Douglas McIntyre, Douglas uh, from Creeping Bent Records, who's a good friend of ours and plays yeah. in our band. Um, do you know, I'm just trying to think, did I do backing vocals with there? Because I know Ken played on, my brother Ken played with Sugar Town. And I, I may have done some. I mean, they, these are the ones that saw like credited, you know, you're credited on these so uh, like albums yeah. and records. And there's also BMX Bandit as well. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Um, Raise, was yeah. it Raise of Golden? I did that with Cecile from the BMX Bandits. And yeah. yeah. <clears throat> well, speaking of BMX Bandits, because Monty uh, Mandigoria, who's got this show, It's All About New Wave, which is like every Friday. At I think it's the same time, 2 o'clock in the UK and 9 p.m. In, in Manila. Um, Douglas Stewart is going to be guesting on that hey, show. Friday. Great, so, great yeah, talk. So, yeah, <laughs> so that should be really good um, you know, for all indie fans out there. Um, but, <laughs> I mean, I did ask you before if it's if you're rushing out because I know it's already after, you know, there's like more than now but it's just really nice talking to you i gotta um, get to the studio come on I, i'm talking to anna right now i know that time is money dollars and i'll find out the window. i'm talking to anna right now this is kind of important okay the studio can wait man i'm my time for you Yes, sorry. You're, Sunday, you're, great. you're great with accents. It's just drummers amazing. are good with accents, drummers are good with mimicking. That's a, that's a terrible generalization, but we we listen and feel the nuances of different voices and accents. <laughs> Russell, Russell Irvin's great with accents as well, actually. Oh, really? From the Bluebells, who's who's on, I think. It's also good. And um, one one of the members that I've noticed, um, uh, the Bluebells members in there is um, Gary Crowley. That's not the Gary Crowley who's like a radio presenter. Gary Crowley, here we go. We got the gem. We got Paul Willer here. <laughs> <laughs> he's brilliant. Love Gary. He's excellent. Uh, so was, he really, was he a member of the Bluebells? Do you know, Gary was like a, we became a total mate of ours. So, the connection was 
when we, the Bluebell signed a publishing deal first, before we signed a record deal, there was quite a number of, eventually there was quite a number of record labels wanting to sign the Bluebells. But we've signed a publishing deal first. Probably quite a sensible thing to do. Um, but anyway, um, so Clive Banks, music, pardon me, um, ATV was the company, uh, the publishing company. So of course we come down to London and uh, we bought a minibus um, that used to belong to a uh, Kenny Ball and his jazz men. I don't know why I remember that, but anyway, so that we could then set up a tour and stuff like that and do our own little tours. So we signed the publishing deal. So Gary Crowley was working for the publisher. He was working for Clive Banks. Uh, and of course, the first time we met him, I'm like, that. wow, Gary Crowley, because he used yeah. to be on the kids' programs, you know, um, like after school type programs. And he would be there, you know, like on like, you know, introducing like punk rock or, or yeah. new that. And I can't remember even the names of the programs, but it was like your man about town, you know, quite very hip sort of new music that was coming out. He was a big jam fan and obviously yeah, yeah. he was a big mate of Paul Weller, isn't that? But oh, um, yeah, yeah. brilliant, brilliant, you know, knows his music. So we just totally got on. We all loved Gary, you know, he was absolutely brilliant. Um, and then he was on the video, that's right. I think is it the Cath video? He's in the Cath video and he came to loads of gigs and he would he was a yeah. DJ so we'd go to his clubs and uh, just you know still was, back in touch with Gary as well. He still DJs, That's of course. Brilliant. Yeah, it was his birthday last week, I think. I, I love Gary. Yeah, I love Gary Crowley because oh, you yeah. know he's got a great radio show and yeah, and he he plays so like not many. <laughs> so like he plays Candy Opera songs, which I really yes. really You're appreciate. A master <laughs> fan, I know that. Yeah, and there's something and, internally, uh, eternally, eternally boyish about Gary. I think he still looks like a boy. You know what I mean? Yeah. And the news, yeah. And it's just that enthusiasm and that energy is just, it's infectious, it's, it's brilliant. Yeah, he's amazing, yeah, he's really good. And I don't know if you've noticed it this week, but Facebook was off for like hours. It was the longest time that it's been off. And How did Instagram. you go? How did you function? <laughs> oh my Instagram was off. And, and um, but Twitter was on and I was all like, oh. but anyways, what wow. I did is felt like, <laughs> I, I put Netflix on and I saw this film called Count Me In. I don't know if you've seen it. Do think there's so. a really good film called Count Me In. And it's, well, the way they say it, it's like a love letter from drummers to drumming. I, I mean, you should really watch it, but anyway, yeah. Um, it's called Count Me In, and there's a clip there with um, showing Joe Strummer um, saying that. I mean, I'm, I have to read this because I don't want to sort of like you because know, I'm quoting him. So he said, mm -hmm. um, "The rule of rock and roll says you're only as good as your drummer. That is really true because <laughs> because if you try to imagine a group and the drummer is falling apart, no matter what you put on top." it's going to fall apart absolutely it's, it's, and it's, it's, I, yeah. yeah and i think that's where bobby gillespie sort like got yeah. his quote from because bobby gillespie said a band is only as good as its drummer absolutely absolutely <laughs> it's, it's so true i mean total total backbone you know the backbone of you know any band the complete framework which you then adds the clothes and the colors you know yeah, the different yeah. notes and the guitars and the bass and you know, but it's the whole framework. Um, backbone is the drummer. And I think drummers are like, you've got a great perspective as a drummer. You're at the back. It is the guy at the back, you know, who's not in any of the photographs, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you have a great perspective of the band, you know, and even the relationship with the rest of the members. But sometimes yeah. I often think about that. You're sitting, you know, literally you're sitting at the back of the band and, you're, you know, you're, you're the total powerhouse, you know. Of that band and of those songs, every drummer yeah. is essential, absolutely. Um, and even, you know, I think drummers are totally where they sit within groups. You always know, they know what's going on. They know what's going on. You know, yes. they know the gossip, you know, they know how the band works. They've got quite a key role to play, you know, off stage as well. Just, it's quite interesting just to kind of 
dynamic of the drummer as well off stage. Yeah, yeah. We are quite interesting creatures. And then, uh, and then I, when you start, yeah. when you start with sort of like big, big, big. <laughs> like, well, that's right. That's it's just essential. Amazing. I know. I, I, <laughs> Uh, you know, and, and sometimes you're on a stage and it's a massive stage and it's dead noisy and you can't hear it or the audience are really noisy. or And, and so there's all that non-verbal communication, you know, um, either it's clicking your sticks or it yeah. is verbal. One, two, three, four. You know, that's why I always loved the Ramones. You know, they hardly took a breath between songs. You saw the Ramones and it was like, whoa, an hour and 40 minutes just of like, you know, three minute thrash, you know, punk songs. And uh, you'll hear the last chord. What do I Brilliant. But that count, you know, that pulse, that, that dynamic, that totally held the whole thing together. But often you're on stage, you can't hear it. It's really difficult to communicate. You maybe can't even see each other, you know. Um, so, but when you've got that, cha, 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 you know, yeah. you're in the what do I throw for? It sounds great as well. Some of my favorite records of all time have got that on it. What do I throw for? <laughs> No. <laughs> oh, I just love it when I go to a gig, and every time, so like the drummer will start it with that. I just, oh my god, this is gonna be it's so cool. Theater. It's theatre, it's pure theatre, isn't it? Do you know, I don't mean that as pretentious, but it's like it's great to watch. I, I love it. <laughs> Watching the back, and oh, here he is. Oh, it starts with the drummer, brilliant. Yeah, um, do, do you still I'll, go to do you still go to a lot of gigs? Like, yeah, oh, absolutely. Yoga, obviously, but going to see bands and do you still go and see? Bands? Oh, oh, just yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Love, love, love going to see bands and all kinds of bands, you know, and uh, live performance, you know, absolutely. Yeah, um, pretty eclectic that way. But obviously, it's been difficult the last eighteen months trying to go and see any bands. But um, you know, and obviously, there's been lot online events and mm -hmm. online festivals, but. Mm, it's yeah, not the same as is, you know, it, being oh, there and yeah, seeing yeah, them live and stuff. Yeah. Um, and in, in yeah. Glasgow, we have that, you know, luxury. It's just there's venues everywhere. You know, it's fantastic, you know, of all sizes, you know. I can go around yeah. the corner, you know, and go to a pub that's got a basement down below it and it's like 200 capacity, you know, or one that's got 100 capacity and see a singer-songwriter, you know, or a new yeah. young band or obviously theatres and concert halls and SECs, you know, but uh, venues of all sizes. But, I mean, when you see the, the what's on, the gig guide in Glasgow, yeah. I mean, that's not like any major city, but uh, every night of the week, if you wanted to, you know, as you know, Anna, every night, <laughs> you know, 120 <laughs> playing every night in Glasgow, not just summertime or festivals. <laughs> And it's the it's the life force, you know, of Glasgow and of the music scene. And there's always been waves and waves of different music scenes and changing yeah, and yeah, new yeah. um new scenes coming up. You're like, brilliant, right? Let's check this out, you know. Yeah. I don't try and uh, stay in touch with 14 year olds and then try and rip them off and go, right, okay, I'm going to oh I need that's what I need to be playing. Okay. <laughs> um Well, you're playing at Glad Cafe this weekend, right? Is it? I wish, is it, that's is it this yeah. Yes, yes, that's right. I wish, I, I wish Glasgow was closer, you know, so like, no. I, would, I would have loved to so my God. But Beam it's up. just, me up it's to just difficult, you know, because it's like, um, the last time I was in Glasgow, I had to sort of like ask the husband to give me, you know, to drive me over there, so we turn it into a bit of a, a holiday, but, you know, you can't do it, so like, you know, if you Again. Could ask, <laughs> what was the thing that they had in Star Trek? If you could ask the audience that, that question, what was the thing that they, they beamed you up? Beam me up, yeah, beam me up, Scotty. <laughs> you remember the and then you would appear on Planet Zorg. <laughs> Planet Zorg. Yeah. Uh, so that'd be great to do for gigs, wouldn't it? And not be like, brilliant, excellent. Yeah, no. I was playing in Greenwich Village tonight. Oh, I'm there. I'm there in two minutes. Wouldn't it be brilliant? <laughs> So, yeah, we're playing uh, this weekend and um, Glad Cafe, which is a brilliant wee venue. Um, yeah. Brilliant sort of DIY kind of, you know, uh, organic sort of foods, you know, sort of yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, it's vegan, a vegan food kind of uh, great ethos, that place. They do all kinds of creative events and they've got a great gig at the back. Um, I don't know, maybe holds 200 max. Yeah, yeah. Brilliant. 
So McCluskey Brothers, so Ken and I are playing. We're going to do a set, the two of us, and then we're going to invite the band on. So it'll be the full band for the second half, you know, so a bit of a... Oh, my God. Wait, one, you know, so. Oh, wow. Oh, I wish I was going there. <laughs> Campbell, Campbell playing as well. Campbell Owen playing. Campbell's not, so the people we have in that band, so our own band is the McCluskey Brothers. Uh, we have Ross McFarlane, and Ross yeah. has played with loads of different bands. He played with Texas, um, so many different groups. Uh, and then we've got uh, Gary John Kane, and Gary John plays with the Proclaimers. He's a bass oh, player. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Again, yeah. plays with lots of different bands. So these are guys that were in our original band, you know, which is brilliant. Yeah, yeah. They all band back together. So, and then we've got Ali McLeod, and Ali played with Hipsway. Uh, Ali's a good Um yeah. And then there's Kane and I. Yeah, like like I said, you're all so, like, connected, don't you? I mean, it's like a Liverpool or, or Manchester. Yeah. So, like, all these it's musicians. Very small scene, actually, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Different yeah. generational oh. scenes, but, yeah, all yeah. linked to uh, I love Glasgow. I should so I would love to go there so like often. But okay. Um I'm gonna ask, do you have any drumming heroes? Drumming um, heroes I'll, I'll always love because you know you're always especially that young age, that formative age when you're like, I want to do that. Or you want <laughs> somebody and you go, I want to be him. I want <laughs> him right now, you know. So uh, you know, the drummer of the Buzzcocks, John Mayer. Uh, oh, really? brilliant, amazing drummer, you know, really busy and energetic and oh, stunning, really stunning. Yeah, yeah. Totally inspired by him. Topper heading of the clash, absolutely brilliant, you know, beautiful. Um, yeah. Just so much energy. And just these drummers that they're totally fused with the song. You know, sometimes you can get that imbalance. You get a drummer where it's just like, it's really over the top, you know, or it's not really in balance with the song, you know, or the song's getting strangled by, you know, too much. Oh, or, yeah. Or, yeah. You know, the wrong kind of style or, you know, but just, I think that's so important as a drummer, you know, it's like, it's the song should should really yeah. lead and, and breathe, you know, so you're kind of fitting in alongside the structure of the song. So if somebody comes with a song and they present it to you, obviously you might change things, but you're going, right, what's the rudimentary, the fundamental parts of that song is the chorus, what's the rhythm like, what's the kind of, um, the tempo, what's it? So you try a few different things, but the song has to oh, be celebrated first. So anyway, Topper Hedden, fantastic drummer, brilliant dynamics, and one of these guys that could play any kind of style. So as a young kid, you were like, whoa, listen to these different styles. He would merge into the class. So it was punk, but there was obviously, there was soul and there was blues and, right. you know, uh, reggae, absolutely. Yeah, you know, yeah. And then, of course, with well, a lot of these bands, they had reggae bands supporting them. So as a kid, you know, when you've never really heard any black, you know, artists, mm -hmm. or you don't really know much about black music, you know, it was great to see Misty and Roots and a lot of punk bands had reggae bands supporting them. So you were like, whoa, you know, <laughs> introduced to this soundscape or this sound world which you knew nothing about. Yeah. As wide the the early as wide, you know, were supporting quite a lot of punk bands and letting Quasi Johnson perform as poets, you know, different art forums coming from different cultures. Fascinating, you know. But drummers, yeah, uh, Pete Thomas from Elvis Castell and the Attractions. We the Bluebells did a tour supporting Elvis Castell and the Attractions. So that was great because you're the sport band. So every night you're like at the side of the stage. You know, watching Pete Thomas, you know, big big six foot seven bloke, you know. On his wee great kit, you know, like wow. Yeah, yeah. You're constantly inspired, you know. Um, Blair Cunningham, you know, sort of uh, funk pop drummer, and he he played with when we toured with the uh, Haircut 100. And the Haircut 100, early eighties were ma in the UK. They were massive, you know, the biggest band. At yeah, that time. yeah, yeah, and yeah. Nick Hayward asked us to support um, Haircut 100, so we were the support band. So again. You're at the sides after your show. You're and watching, and, watching. <laughs> you know, this incredible, you know, drummer, you know, playing sort of funky pop, all these different styles. You thought, know, what is he doing there? You know, just really beautiful playing, totally inspired. Yeah. Um, but yeah, of course, well, uh, drummers are completely inspired. Yeah. I've never prog rock or, you know, that kind of really self indulgent Carol Palmer. Like all that these surrounded, surrounded with them. <laughs> it didn't move me a lot of these guys. 
it, it don't move me, man. It don't move me. <laughs> Do you like doing drum solos? Like when you're, say, I don't know, I can't think of a song like a blue ball song where they just actually leave you with the drum solo. And <laughs> I know I'm not that. I'm not really the good as a band where it's just a musical drummer kind of band. I never really thought of myself as a you know, virtues or, uh, of course, I, I can have my moments, you know. I, I think it's good when it spontaneously happens. I'm not really a big fan of drum solos, personally, but it's quite nice you know, when that just spontaneously happens, the band drop out, and it's like you decide, hold on a minute, you know, I'm going to just go I'm somewhere just... else. And you just have a wee tangential kind of performance bit that just happens naturally without it being, okay, drum solo, and you've got your gongs, <laughs> and I've got my black vest, you know, and my kind of Japanese sun kind of <laughs> my, my bad, <laughs> my bad tattoos, you know, not really that kind of guy or that kind of drummer, but uh, funny, yeah, <laughs> all those. <laughs> um, tonight. So, but I love it when oh that happens, you know, because going to see The Clash and bands like the Buzzcock, there, there was lots of kind of elements of, drum solo in there, you know, but it was actually part yeah. of the, story, the song, but you were like, that. whoa, that's incredible. Without it being like, hey, I'm the star of this band. <laughs> oh. um, have you ever had any sort of like drumming disasters when you were sort of like playing? Drumming disasters? I did yeah. fall off the stool once. Yeah, I fell off my drum stool once doing a kind of bit of a... You did? Hey! <laughs> um... And it was probably with it. It was in the early days when we were doing a couple of gigs. I think we we're doing. I think it was in Edinburgh actually. And I have to admit, and I've never done this since, but I have to admit, I was a bit pissed. Um, and I was about uh, maybe about seventeen, and I had a few beers before the gig. And then it was like after that, it's like, okay, no, don't do the, don't do it again. Some people <laughs> go in pissed, and some people are, play better. <laughs> uh, but, <laughs> Not me. So what happened? In the early days, I'm like, right, okay. But, so that disasters, uh, yeah, and, and just try to think of any other kind of disasters. Um, drumming disasters, there must be, must be a but few. Maybe hurt yourself while playing, like, <laughs> apart from falling over or something. Maybe so, like, because uh, I saw um, one time there was this drummer who actually, I think the sticks all, like, hit his head or something, and there's blood. Mm -hmm. Flowing out and get be concussed. He still yeah. carried on. He still carried yeah. on playing. Yeah. And I thought. I, I, I do remember. You know, I think it was more on tour. I think it might have been touring with Haircut One Hundred. And I do remember like the muscle at the tendon in my right hand. So you're playing away intensity of the gig. You know, yeah, here we go. And then I just felt this weaken, and it was almost like my muscle went into a bit of a spasm, and I couldn't hold the stick anymore. And I'm like, so I had to almost thread the drumstick through like fingers. So I was. This kind of gnarled hand, you know, just to get through this. You know. And I end up, the song oh. stopped down, and I've got a big bit of gaffer tape, and I taped the stick to my hands. It was like that. <laughs> I couldn't do it. And it, it was a transient thing. I mean, I think the next day it was actually okay, you know. And I thought, well, I wonder, yeah. wonder what it was. You know, just some kind of spasm, and I, I lost the kind of muscle power of hold, holding a stick. I thought, that's a nightmare. So I thought that might be me. My days are finished of being a drummer, but thankfully, I built it up. <laughs> well, do you have any advice then for aspiring drummers? You know, after that, don't get your <laughs> or maybe exercise your fingers or something. <laughs> yeah, you've got warming up, yeah. Right? warming up, warming up. Yeah, you go and yeah, get your your body ready. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I suppose all um, related to the times, of course. But you know. I remember going through the whole era of drum machines and click tracks, right? So in the 80s, this was a big thing, right? So we were, you know, in different London studios and the producer would be like, right, yeah, you're speeding up there in the chorus, you know, or yeah, you're speeding up, you know. So the kind of attitude was, the approach was, no, no, it had to, your timing had to be absolutely perfect, dead on. And then, so, you, so you'd have the headphones and a click track. Okay. So I was introduced to that really at that point. I'm probably about 17 at the time. Um, but you're starting to make records. So you so of course, yeah, we'll get let's get a click track because you're you're speeding up there. Okay. So uh you have the headphones on. And of course, at that time, not knowing how to 
write a click track, you know. Obviously now you know that, or eventually learned, you get the drum machine and you can write a nice little <laughs> yeah. pattern to play with. Or get a little marimba kind of you sound or whatever, something that's singing in your head, but it's giving you the tempo. But of course, initially I'm like that, I didn't really know how to use drum machines. So it'd just be a cowbell. So you've got a cowbell going, arr, 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 arr. So if you can imagine your headphones on there, okay, here we go, let's go for a take, rolling. Arr, 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 arr. You know, so try to play in time with that. Nightmare, complete nightmare. You know, so I was having a bit, so that's probably a bit of a disaster. Trying to figure out how to work with this thing, you know. And it's, it was the early 80s, so, I mean, I love drum machines. I love electronic music, you know. Um, but for us, there was a wee bit of it was two worlds colliding, you know. Um, yeah. And then, so, what was going to say, so I eventually, I, yeah, I found ways of yeah, tweaking it, and it doesn't make yeah. all yeah. the sounds. Um, and then, so I would use drum machines, and very soon, absolutely got completely fused with it and it's like right that's actually a really good um uh, discipline you know at the same time you know you were kind of losing some of the dynamics that you would have live as a live band if, if everything's perfectly in time and it has to be this very metronome based timing it doesn't really work okay sometimes that can work for certain records okay mm -hmm. um but you were missing something that's there live so i actually believe uh, some songs should speed up, That's absolutely. And the energy changes, whether it's like, here we go, here's the chorus, and we're going to go up or not. We're going yeah. up at the end, yeah. Because it's like, whoa, here's the exciting bit, you know. Or it might be the outro of the song, yeah. here's the outro, you know, of the song. Yeah. Like, everything's really building up, crescendo, we're going to go up, a couple of BPM, yeah, brilliant, you know. Um, so that's something that you learn. Um, and. You know, I love disco and I love, you know, real kind of a lot of electronic uh, music. Um, but for some styles, it doesn't really suit it, you know. So it's that integrity. Drummers have to find their, 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 their space and that kind of integrity. Is it is it working for them? You know, do they want to use drum machines or click tracks? Or, um, but just remembering that as human beings, we're not supposed to be drum drum machines, you know. Yeah, of course, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. They basically wanted me to play like a drum machine, you know, even do drum fills like a drum machine. And that's like craft work and you know, the way that they use drum machines and drum codes and fantastic, absolutely beautiful. Um, different sound world altogether, different contexts altogether. Love that, you know, but that was been forced upon me to play like a drum machine. It's like that's a it's not, no, yeah, no. not in a band, you know. Um, Do you know, I, I'm actually so like I really love this so like episode because I've been asking you things about drumming. I mean, it's like ask the drummer podcast as well. We've been so like an interview with the drummers, but not about drumming at all. That's <laughs> great. That's, that's why I came. <laughs> Because you know, I've, I've done really boring interviews, you know, in the past, <laughs> in the 80s, and it's like Euro drummer, you know, global sticks, you know, or whatever, <laughs> things that magazines at the time, interviews. Yeah, can we speak to, yeah, Dave, great. We've got an interview with you. Great. Okay. So you go to a wee room somewhere and just answering all these questions, you know, about time signatures and kit, <laughs> what gear you use and symbols and, you know, okay. Sometimes that can be quite interesting, but often just loaded, you know, this kind of real musical kind of technical baggage. I'm bored by this interview and it's me that's talking. But no, but this is fun because it's like about everything. It's your story. You know? It's your story. <laughs> but anyways, God, it's like nearly two hours that we're talking. I mean, it's just so much fun talking to you. And I love all your it's accents. Awesome. And <laughs> <laughs> I've got some white tea left. And so you've got some more white tea left. But, um, right, any white final, tea. final words? <laughs> our final countdown! <laughs> ah, the final countdown! <laughs> That'd be good in a, a metal band, wouldn't it? A kind of big hair rock. Maybe that was, <laughs> my, you know, my niche. You know, I should have gone for big hair rock. Yeah. Ah, 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 ah. <laughs> A horrible vibration. 
<laughs> We've got Karen just saying, um, Karen McPherson, hi everyone, late to the party. She's out there. But she made it. Hello, Karen. Hey, Karen. No, Karen, well, see it. Yeah. There. yeah. <laughs> oh my God. Thank you so much. Thank you, God, Anna. I really, I really love this interview. Oh my God. You're so good. You're, you're, you're just so amazing. And I've got to say, you're gorgeous. Not you. yourself. I was like, yeah. <laughs> when I saw you at the car park, you. You, you, you look so young and young, young at heart, you know. Oh, <laughs> that's right here. Like, Do you know what? That's a dyed white. It's dyed white. It's just not brown underneath. I'm young. I mean, uh, t tell them, tell them, tell them. <laughs> oh, no, you really are. You look, you look amazing. Oh, drumming you know? keeps you young. I have to say, drumming, percussion keeps you young. Yeah. <laughs> it up. Connectivity, energy. <laughs> Brilliant. Oh, what's the good? Thank you so much. And a big hug. A big hug for me. Come on, a hug a yeah. I'm, 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 <laughs> Come on, do you not know what day it is? It's <laughs> National Hug a Drummer. Happy National Hug a Drummer Day. Is that global no. or is that just in the UK? No, is that no, in the UK. That's in the UK. So uh, don't go anywhere outside the UK. So they <laughs> right, better not. Okay, I might be in, in the cell. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much thank you and hope to see you again and see and the bluebells someday soon absolutely yeah thank you thank for all you. your enthusiasm and your support and your knowledge it's quite incredible what do you know <laughs> this is dangerous <laughs> kill her she knows too much <laughs> kill her <laughs> oh, oh, joke, joke. Oh, thank you so much, David. And thank you. See you again soon. Bye. 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 <laughs> oh, my God. That was so amazing. God, it's nearly like two hours of chatting to him, but it was so wonderful. Um, but um, anyways, thank you all so much for um, joining us live. And um, enjoy the rest of your weekend. And keep an eye out for next week's um, uh, guest announcement. Uh, it's going to be an awesome one. So, anyways, um, love music, love life. And remember, it's um, National Hug a Drummer Day today. So, if you see a drummer, give them a hug. And as always, love, love, love drummers because they're so awesome. Bye, everyone. Bye.